appreciate everybody coming. Okay. <laughs> hey, I really do. I never mentioned A, but I feel like this is going to be like the A part. So, tell us your name. And uh, hi, I'm Marcus. I'm glad to be here. I know. I'm, a, I'm not a user, but I want to be one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm not a user, but I want to be one. Reverse AA. Better than anonymous. I used Better to be. Better than anonymous. Yeah. Better than anonymous. I want to be a future user, but legally. <laughs> Well, we're hoping that uh, organizations like this and events like this kind of clear up the air about what cannabis actually is. A uh, big problem that most people have is that they have this in interpretation of what cannabis is based off uh, growing up. And a lot of us grew up, you know, in the 80s and 70s and 90s. And, and in that general area, you had the big say no to drugs, right, Nancy? Um, Reagan pushed uh, drug-free America, and of course at that time frame, there was next to no uh, real research done on cannabis, but there was a lot of people who believed that this was an overreach of, of government, that this was really something that maybe we, we need to probably uh, dial back and look into. So California winds up getting legalized in the late, late 80s, early 90s, and I think Maine was one of the first ones in 88 or something of that nature, yeah, right? So much of the age and everything since the 70s, so they were like, well, they were already doing it anyways. In Maine, it was like, well, we've been doing it anyways. It was like <laughs> carrying a gun and carrying a gun. They were just doing it anyways. And over time, uh, more and more states have legalized. And now we're sitting at what, 34? 36. 36 states. And after this next election, you may see Florida be another one. So, but <laughs> we're going to see what happens <laughs> in this next election. Over the past 30 to 40 years, there's been a dramatic change in uh, the ideology of cannabis and that it's actually good for us and that we should be probably using this over the prescription drugs. And what's interesting about that is that cannabis came here, the medical cannabis that we have came from Southern Asia up and through the trade routes of Indian trade routes and moved over and the slave ships came up through uh, Mexico and then it brought all that good weed up to here and that's how we got it. Now the industrial hemp that we've been using to make sales and everything else, same family, same genus, it just grew up north. It grew tall, it grew long, and they used it for stocks, and they used it for sales and clothes and everything else. And that came from Mongolian Empire all the way across to Americas, where they still used it quite a bit. Fast forward, early 1930s, it gets illegal. The only time that it really gets illegal, right? Now that it's illegal, it's not only just illegal, but it's illegal all over the world for some reason because America is now a superpower. And in order to do trade agreements, one of the things you can't do is have a scheduled one drug that's legalized in your country. So if you go to Jamaica, it's not necessarily legal, but it is if you're native, right? All because that's the agreement they had with America. Why? Because by one of the parliamentarians, one of they told me, don't pull on Superman's cape. So now we have a very healthy plant that is good for the body that's, that can be used as medicine to alleviate a lot of problems, but is now, for some reason, intricately entwined into all politics and treaties. And so it's kind of like taking uh, a plate of spaghetti and saying, find the end of the other one. <laughs> Take two ends and find it. It's very difficult. You're having to pull this thing apart piece by piece. And it starts with education. And here at Him for Victory, which uh, I'm proud to have my, uh, Corey Millsap is one of our uh, members, is very important that we educate people about what cannabis is, uh, why we are where we're at, and how do we move past it, all right? Um, we're not going to tell you any type of specific bills or anything like that that are going on because I don't know what's going to happen with them. And, and we don't lobby for anybody. We lobby for your right to know. And, and if anything, that's what we're going to do. You want to tell me a little bit about your service? Yeah, so I'm going to tell you about my story about how I found cannabis. And this is something I think a lot of people and veterans understand. So I got out of the Army in 2007. I spent two and a half years in Iraq, a total of five years in the Army, so half my time was spent deployed. I lost nine guys in on, my, on one of my units. I've lost a total of about 12 soldiers while uh, deployed. And, of course, that hits you pretty heavy, but when I got out, you know, I, my, my high school sweetheart and I got back together. I hit the ground running. I had a kid. I went to college, went to A&M, finished up my degree, got a career just checking off the list, just like I thought I was supposed to do, right? Check off the list. But with doing all of this, I kept drinking a lot more. And I had to deal with pain for my feet 
and my knees and my back. I still had to stay in shape so I'd go work out, which would cause other problems. So I would wind up drinking and taking Advil or however many pain medications I could take. Over time, I'm at a fifth of whiskey and a 12 pack of beer every three days and I'm having about 10 to 12 pain pills a day. This is not sustainable. I'm yelling at my kid and I shouldn't be. And in my mind, I can tell, and I think a lot of people like this, in my mind, I see the person that I want to be, right? But there's this visible brick wall in front of me. And I don't know how to bring this wall down, but I can see the person that I want to be, you know, is this big teddy bear of a father who just wants to be there for his kids and his wife, right? So how do I become this person? And I was struggling, and I, and I reached out to some buddies of mine and a, and a cousin of mine who was in the industry. He's up in Montana now. He told me, he's like, you ought to try uh, cannabis. And I was thinking like most everybody, like, I don't, I don't want to get high, I want to get better. He says, that's, that's the misconception. He said, trust me, try it. So he sent me these little fish oil pills, and I had my Bible study over, and I remember I took one, and I was giving my daughter a bath, and I took out, and I felt this warm feeling come over my body, and I was like, man. That's familiar. I'm high. <laughs> and I was like, I felt great. And I sat there and I, I got, we, we got our little bath done. And I put her into bed and I was having a great time with that because it was my daughter, you know, and I, I like spending time with her. And, uh, and I noticed that uh, I started using these, this medication, these pills, and I just didn't, for a week, I didn't touch a drink. And I didn't even realize it. It had been days before I even had a drink. I didn't even think about it. I was like, man, you know what? I haven't had a drink in like three or four days. That's insane. I hadn't gone three or four days without having a drink in years. So once, that, once I started going down that path, a lot of things cleared up, like my, how I would approach a problem. Instead of a knee-jerk reaction, I spent a little more time thinking about the problem, find a better answer, find a better alternative, right? And that's important when you're raising kids, because when you're raising kids, you're gonna get mad at things. He's got two little ones and he knows this. Things happen, right? Kids are gonna be kids and you wanna get really mad. But then you gotta remember, hey, these are kids. There's a better way to teach them just getting yelled at them like your dad did. Your dad didn't know, ain't nothing wrong with that. My dad's a great father, he was, he was a perfect father. Sorry about that. Yeah, but Every generation works to get better than the, four, the one before that. That means even raising your kids or whatnot. And so I noticed it gave me the ability to slow down, think about what I'm doing, and make a better decision, not miss, make a decision. So it was something that really changed my life. So now I use cannabis as a way to mitigate my life so that I can have the best day-to-day -day experience. I don't want to be high all the time. That's completely a waste of my time and a waste of my effort. I gotta, be a, I gotta be a husband, I gotta be a father, then I gotta be a, I gotta run a nonprofit. These are the orders of, uh, that, that matter to me. And so when I realized that that happened, I wanted to make sure that, that other veterans had that opportunity to be the best version of themselves, to find their purpose in their life. And so I started, I tried to start a farm, didn't work out that great, but it was fun. <laughs> I think you remember that year, I do. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but over time, I really got into the activist role. And I, I, that's where I enjoyed it. That's where I had the, the, the most uh, success. And I think that's where we're gonna find the most success. If people start to realize how cannabis can help them and they start to experiment with it and try different things to help with their ailments and they can reduce the amount of, of uh, pharmaceuticals they're taking in and become a better person and a better family member, then I think that's something we should offer them. Right, and education like this is what's going to really drive that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seizures in my sleep, mm. but I don't know, so it's time that I don't want to sleep. I haven't well since for 16 years, because I'm scared to go to sleep. I, I, I don't know if I'm gonna wake up, because mm -hmm. I'm having like three of them. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I wake up, only how I know I've had my wake up, my body you know, feels different. It's like, oh shit, it's like, Tension in my shoulder. Like I, I, think, I know I'm, I messed with the the cuff. My friend got it on film when I, 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 I was trying to sleep around people and mm -hmm. go to the house and kind of use your guest bedroom just because I'm scared about sleep. I'm, if something happened if someone can hear me, yeah. You know, because I sleep on my back, which is another bad thing. Because mm -hmm. if I sleep on my side, it'd be safe. Because if I, when I'm having them, you know, mm -hmm. but because I'm on my back, 
and he called me one time and I had one in his house and I swear to God, this arm was like, you can see my fingers. Mm. Oh, so, wow. You'll be happy to know it has high application for epileptic incidents. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly the reason why I was doing it like a, like a madhouse, you know, within reason, mm -hmm. without people knowing. But I didn't like the company or the, the people that were attracted to because they know, mm -hmm. you know, I don't mm -hmm. need that kind of, and stuff like that, right? So I was like, damn, I just, you know, and I told you when I was in HR, <laughs> my director was like, oh my God. I'm so new, man, I'm on CBD. I was like, man, what's, what's, what is this? This is like, so all of this has been things in the back of my head for these few years that I need art because there's no real teaching about it. No one's going to teach me about it. So this mm -hmm. is really good. <laughs> well, when Dr. Rosario gets here, he'll be able to tell you a lot about uh, some of those issues and how it actually works, why it actually works so well. Yes. And I think <laughs> people don't realize is that the at the end of your spinal cord, you know, you, and I remember Dr. Birch were talking about this. In the spinal cord, you don't have the CBD receptors. You don't have the cannabinoid receptors because that would send it straight up to your heart and your brain and everything else, which is why you don't overdose like that. But you have opioid receptors down there. And so when you take too many opioids, that's one reason why your brain and everything else shut down is it's overcompensated. Mm -hmm. The body won't allow the, the cannabinoids to get there, but allows the opioids to get there because it's been manipulated. And don't get me wrong, there's a reason to have all types of medication. Uh, but we are we are a, a pill popping society in America, and we are definitely feeling the uh, the, the we are feeling the effects of it in, in a big way, and we need to write that write that uh, ship. Well, I want Chelsea to talk a little bit, come up here and talk a little bit about. We'll talk about uh, Schedule One and Schedule Three. We'll start federally and work ourselves down to the state. That's how I had it planned. I, that's that's probably the best way. I understand how the federal works. Of, uh, go to the state is, and then go to the city. Yeah. How's that sound? Yeah. Hey, good. Good. All right, let's do that. So, thank you all for having me out. Um, veterans issues are something I'm incredibly passionate about. My grandfather was a veteran. I, if you come to my office, his flag is right behind me on my desk. And I took into a lot of his VA appointments and saw the way that our, I remember the first appointment I took him and I was absolutely disgusted with the level of care that this country was giving to, to veterans at that time. So this is something I, I do speak a lot pro bono for veterans organizations. Happy to help if y'all ever, you know, have questions or anything. But um, the way I planned today was to kind of go over legality issues because a lot of veterans are scared to to try medical marijuana or to access it because they're worried about some of the adverse implications both in their daily lives and their professional lives. So at the federal level, cannabis still remains Schedule 1. It's right up there with heroin and LSD. And to classify a substance as Schedule 1 in the United States, it has to have no medicinal value and high potential for abuse. We have decades of demonstrated research out of other developed nations like Israel that show not only does cannabis itself as a plant have med medicinal application, each individual cannabinoid, phytocannabinoid within that plant, which are the chemical constituents like THC, like CBD, each one has vastly different therapeutic application and we're just at the cusp of figuring out which each one of these different cannabinoids do. Unfortunately, because of its Schedule One status here in the United States, our researchers or wholly precluded access to research it. Yes, in theory, you can get a Schedule One research license. The DEA will sit on your application for seven to eight years. Um, two of my friends did some of the lawsuits. It was actually for Dr. Sisley that opened some medicinal research here. But they're very limited in the plant material that they can utilize. It all comes from the University of Mississippi. It is trash cannabis. It's what you would smoke in the 1920s. It's moldy. It's full of weeds and seeds. We have recreational strands that are exceeding 25% THC. Meanwhile, the things coming out of University of Mississippi are still within the 10 to 12 percent range. So currently the, the VA did make some progress last year because historically the VA was obviously adamantly opposed to medical marijuana but they did come out with a policy recommendation last year in I believe it was July of 2023 and they finally acknowledged that yes we do have a lot of veterans who are using medicinal cannabis and while due to statutory restrictions we cannot prescribe it, we cannot recommend it, we cannot help you enroll to get it and we cannot pay for it, but we will discuss it with you and we will note your electronic health record. So that was a big policy change that we saw come out of the VA last year because your provider will actually acknowledge that you 
are a medical marijuana recipient, they'll note your records and they will talk to you about some of the therapeutic applications. They just simply cannot be the one to give it to you or to recommend a particular program to help you with the forms, any any of that stuff. I do feel for the VA though, because most you know most VA providers that I speak with would love to be able to prescribe you medical marijuana. They'd love to do it in a heartbeat. And they, the hope is that once this is rescheduled down to Schedule 3, which is a nice segue into what's coming at the federal level, they'll be able to do so. So um, this has been all over the news. President Biden ordered a rescheduling directive where he wanted HHS, the relevant agency in charge of our medical program, to look at the capability of moving cannabis into a lower schedule, into Schedule 3, which is where most testosterone drugs reside. When cannabis is rescheduled, and it is a when, not an if, the DEA is, you know, in, in my, I practiced cannabis law for, what, 12, 13 years now. Uh, in my opinion on this, they will absolutely reschedule. <coughs> it will be tied up in litigation for a bit, so it will be up to a judge whether the rescheduling goes forward or whether some injunctive relief is put in. But once it becomes Schedule 3, it's, sub it's subject to wider pharmaceutical application because it's much easier to research, much easier to access, for those pharmaceutical companies to start developing some of these targeted phytocannabinoid therapies. So once it gets into clinicals and clears clinicals, you will be able to pick up a medical marijuana prescription from CVS, from Walgreens, unless the DEA comes out with something special in the scheduling process, which historically they have, have not done um, for an entire category like this. They have for specific drugs. But you should be able to, you know, within the next five years, access it just as you would any other pharmaceutical drug. Here in Texas, we actually do have a medical marijuana program. A lot of people are <laughs> surprised to hear that. In 2015, yeah, but you're right, it did start because the first prescriptions didn't go out until February of 2018, which speaks to how terrible our program is. Um, I won't knock it because we had to fight tooth and nail to get it, but originally it was 0.5% THC limit. That would not get a hummingbird any benefits from that. It did increase to 1%. The current dispensing organizations are really good at working with you when you get in the program to try to titrate your dose to get you where you need to be within that 1% cap. All three of our dispensing organizations are now operational for the longest time. We had one, then we had two, and it was two for several, several years. Each one will help you get into the program. They all have physicians that they work with who they will send you to if you have a qualifying condition. We did get expansion in the program, thankfully, within the past couple of years that added PTSD, which provides a, a great level of access to a lot of our veterans. But we also have epilepsy, neuroplasticity issues. There's a, a giant list, multiple sclerosis, autism, cancer now. Um, originally, it was only terminal cancer. Now it's any form of cancer. And there are, you know, in all due candor, there are virtual doctors who, if are willing to risk their license to get you the medication that you deserve, even though our statute may, may not um, have an auspice for you to, to, to find that. They will, they will work with you to, to find um, a condition that, that qualifies in there. And they're very helpful, all of our dispensing organizations. They all have staff on hand for medical outreach. They all have wonderful websites where you can go click a tab that says learn more and submit your information and you'll get a call back. You know, they'll send you a doctor and say, this is, this is who we recommend for you to work with. Um, and after that, it's just like any other medication except you pick it up from the actual dispensing organization. Here in Texas, we have a really asinine regulation that we are a vertically integrated state, which means that the medical organizations have to, they, they grow, they extract, they manufacture, they package, and they dispense, seed to sale, which makes cost extremely high for our program. But they cannot store product overnight anywhere in the entire state of Texas. So if you need to pick up medication in El Paso on a Thursday, somebody's getting in a Prius at 1 a.m. in you know Manchaca, Texas, and driving that medication across the state of Texas to the temporary dispensing location for you to pick it up. So a lot of people behind the scenes working to alleviate some of the access issues that we have here. If you don't qualify for the medical program here in Texas, we do have a hemp program. And like Robert said, they are the exact same plant. I can go to one of my medical clients right now, one of the dispensing organizations, walk into the grow room and pick up a seedling of what will become a highly potent cannabis strain and walk out the door with it. If it's below 0.3% delta 9 THC on a dry weight basis, it's hemp.
exact same plan. It's just the minute that it crosses that 0.3 threshold. So when Congress drafted the 2018 Farm Bill, which legalized hemp, and actually 2014 did in, inter in interstate commerce, the DEA argued it didn't, but it did. Um, what they did was address production. They did not address finished goods. So the hemp industry has been able to produce THC inclusive products like edibles and inhalables and beverages. We're seeing a huge rise in hemp derived beverages so that if you're not able to access the program, you can drive 10 minutes from here to a Total Wines or a Specs and pick up a THC seltzer or a THC drink. And I actually have a lot of people who, uh, you know, me personally, um, I wasn't a huge drinker, but I have alcohol at the house. It's covered in dust. I haven't touched that stuff in years. I mean, I literally haven't. Yeah. Um, so there are auspices to access different, I shouldn't use the term medication, but different products that are available to you that you can walk in off the street and purchase. Now, if you have a, a job, this is something, you know, I always tell people, if you have employment, you need to check your employment contract because if you have a restriction on a drug testing policy there, hemp is gonna test positive just as cannabis would test positive because it is the same plant. And we were actually having this discussion before you guys walked in. We don't yet know what the state of Texas is gonna do about termination for use of either a legal hemp product. And I suspect, I know, they would say that's at will, adios. Medical program, a little bit different. There's some disability issues that may kick in. But that's probably the, the leading thing that I would be aware of. And I know this organization doesn't lobby, but if you start these products or get in the program and it helps you, I always ask people, tell your legislator because they hate this program here in Texas. They, they hate it with a bloody passion. They'd love to kill it in a heartbeat. It's Texas. Yeah. That's, that's crazy because I have my CDL in my hands, my SY, which is one of the reasons why I haven't pursued it and mm -hmm. used it and I've done it. It's because of seizure so and always wore glasses since first grade so it's like these two are the reasons of that supposed to be what raised about what you know cannabis can help you with this it, it's there in the program how detailed is your medical do you have to have like this like fbi background of your medical history nope. to be able to say hey I'm, this 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 and i'm trying to rip i'm taking kepro or what, whatever nope. else to get into it or no? No, there are sites like Green Docs. Um, <coughs> it's funny because one of the, the Houston um, news organizations kind of did a hit piece on one of our dispensing organizations because the dispensing organization just fills the prescription. They have no say over what the doctor does. But they, they targeted the dispensing organization because the, the reporter made an appointment with, I think it was Green Docs, had like a 90 second consultation and got his prescription and walked away. They're not gonna ask you, I mean a good doctor obviously is gonna sit down with you and discuss your particular issues. This was, it shouldn't be a 90 second consultation in, in reality. But they're not gonna fingerprint you and go through extensive background checks. They're not gonna drudge up your history. He's gonna ask you, you know, have you ever been di diagnosed with a seizure disorder? Have you ever suffered bouts of epilepsy? And, and you should qualify. I mean, Dr. Rosier can speak more obviously to the medical conditions when he gets here, but you should automatically qualify as soon as a CURT registered physician, and that's the threshold. You have to find a physician who's registered in the Compassionate Use Registry of Texas, but that's exactly what our dispensing organizations do. They will help find you that physician. Yeah. So one of the questions I like to bring up, and this is something when we talk about teacup, is expenses. <laughs> uh, and, and so when they take a look, and that's the problem that they're, they're currently facing, and it's something I think needs to be brought up. The black market is cheaper than the teacup program. Yes. And um, the reason for that is, is that the black market does not have near the regulations, but it should, right? What we really want is uh, there's, there's programs out there. I think Maine's got a really good program uh, where you have what's called caregivers, mm -hmm. right? And they can grow a certain amount and they can sell this. They can make whatever products that they would like to out of it. Um, and they can sell those to farmers markets and, and, and places like that. What this does is allows communities to kind of bind together and you have your local little mom and pop shops there. And they also have a normal medical program where which you can be a part of. Well, that keeps the, uh, all of that uh, cost down. In the teacup program, you're limited on how you can access your customer base. And because it's vertically programmed, you really have to, and, and the licensing and everything else about this is $500,000 so right. just for 487 for two years. 
they're having to, a person who has to buy the amount of medicine that they would need would probably be spend several hundred dollars more a month compared to a normal uh, medical program like you would have in California or Oregon or Maine or anything like that. And the reason why I want to bring this up is that I would be, I would guess to, to think that when a person who wants to get into this program comes to find that this is expensive, uh, I don't quite get what it is that I'm, I'm looking for, I will look other places, right? The people that will stay in this program are people who cannot afford to look other places. And I'm not talking financially, I'm talking about the risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The people who can't immunocompromised, immune compromised people who can't afford to have any any disabilities taken away from them, or that those people will be forced to use the TICA program. Now, politicians may say that's good because they're out of the black market. I say that's bad because you're forcing them to pay more than they need to. Yeah. So that's that that was an issue I wanted to make sure that I brought up that even though that we have this, that it's not necessarily a. Uh, a golden goose. It's not whatsoever, and and not even for the the medical marijuana industry here gets a lot of flack. People, especially in the hemp industry, like to throw them under the bus and say, "Oh, they're just trying to make a monopoly." These guys are losing money, and they're losing money hand over fist right now, particularly because they're uh, will bore you to death with the legalities. But there's an IRS regulation called 280E where they remit 70 to 78 percent of gross back to the federal government. So if they make a million dollars before they can deduct anything uh, that you would normally be able to duck, like a light bill, your employee costs, they don't get any of that. They turn back over about 780K of it right back to the federal government. So that's why our costs are so high, but also our state does not make it easy for dispensing organizations to enter the market here. I mean, it's 500 grand just for the first two years, 387 every two years thereafter, 10 grand just to apply. It's quite so I, got, I have a question. When it goes to Schedule 3, 280 will become obsolete. 280 is, is no longer applicable at that point. So and every cannabis company is salivating for the next about seven right. months. Right. And so the big question I have is what about uh, investments into these companies? Uh, will that start to skyrocket? I mean, it, in all due candor, it already is skyrocketing simply because private equity guys are willing to take that risk. I mean, so right. when I say these guys are losing money on paper, they look great because so many investment tanks are throwing money at them right now. On their bottom line numbers, they're losing money, but they aren't hurting for lack of investors. Right. They're at, well, Texas is such a big market, too. Yeah, everybody mm -hmm. wants into Texas. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, our um, wonderful state law enforcement opened the application window about a year and a half ago. They accepted, uh, I believe, over 200 applications at 10 grand a pop, and they've sat on them now for a year and a half. So <laughs> they haven't even they haven't done a thing with them. <clears throat> so I want to bring this up, too. To currently, Dallas is going to, uh, they, they got 55,000 signatures. So shout out to Ground Game, Austin Zamharari, and those guys. Um, if you've not had an opportunity, if you're in the cannabis industry, if you've not had an opportunity to meet Austin Zemmerary, I would highly suggest he's a very close friend of mine. Dallas is going to decrease. They got the 55,000 signatures, they put it in. Um, originally, I was going to go down there and speak yesterday in front of the council, and they wind up not having the city council meeting, uh, but they did need the votes. But they told them earlier they probably didn't need the votes, but they didn't need the votes, and they needed all those signatures, and it was a good thing that they did it, because you never can trust the political entities. Uh, go based off what they tell you need to get done, right? And they did it. So what does decriminalization at the city level, which is not county, this is not Dallas County, Dallas City, what does that mean? That's an excellent question. So when a city decriminalizes, they set a threshold. You know, they'll say an ounce, half an ounce. It means that within the bounds of that city, they will not arrest and prosecute you. But if you step one toe over that county or that city line, you're fully subject to criminal enforcement and prosecution within any other yeah, so I always do because they're, and I feel sorry for people with that who have a misunderstanding there and, you know, go somewhere and then say, oh, I live in Dallas, they've decrimmed. Well, if an officer pulls you over in Kilgore, Texas, they don't give a rat's ass, excuse my language, but they don't, they're hauling you to jail. So mm -hmm. decrim means that you are free for use and possession within that requisite limit in that particular jurisdiction, but don't leave it. And Texas is, that's a, that's a good point I also like to bring up. We have a lot of people who go visit Oklahoma or New Mexico. Our law enforcement knows this, and they literally have pipelines set up to, a lot of my growers in Oklahoma actually live here in Texas, and they are harassed just about weekly when they are coming back and forth from Oklahoma or, 
you know, you got a bunch of college kids who go to New Mexico for a bachelorette party and they forget one gummy in the car and then all of a sudden the driver is getting kicked out of college and ends up with a felony on their record. It's absolutely yeah. terrible. Mm -hmm. you know, that was, I was in Austin going to school back in 2010. It was, they were going through so much transitions with all this stuff like that and then it gets to this point. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but, which was crazy because I've never been to the event that 20 thing they do in Austin. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I've never been to it. I did all six. was too nervous to go to it. But people would go there and it'd be so packed. And they'd be literally doing nothing medical like this. It's just whatever random they picked up. And police would be. They don't care in Austin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like in that little vicinity or whatever, they go out and they go to Pflugerville or God Bear Rockwall or. Uh, uh, Brown Rock mm -hmm. or Cedar, Cedar Park or something. You're getting arrested. You're, you're, yeah. you're in jail. You're getting, you know. And you know this, but from. you know, mm -hmm. candidly, as as a Black American, your risk is obviously substantially higher. Mm -hmm. It's substan I started my career in criminal criminal defense, so um, and part of the reason I left is, and I've I've been very open about this. I would watch young black defendants receive substantially more time and more hassle through the system than a white defendant. My, here's a prime example. My um, stepfather-in-law is is black and when he was coming to visit us in Texas in the 80s he used to stuff pot in his shoes and I was like you're flying into Dallas if you do that you're going to jail like do not have you lost your mind because he was telling me he was planning yeah. transporting and I was like I'll find you something when you get here but don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. for the love of God do not fly this <laughs> through Dallas airport I'm yeah um, <laughs> and so that's something I, you know, that's an unfortunate reality. Um, and actually, marijuana rescheduling had a, uh, or scheduling in, in its original form really had its roots in racism. Sure, sure um, did. Yeah, there's actual quotes from the Nixon administration that, that you can look at where they, they were specifically tarred in certain racial minorities. But in Texas, I would be remiss if I went and spoke to people about accessing this if I also didn't acknowledge the opportunity risk and especially a higher risk for certain. It was a struggle for me. I was 20, I was 27. Mm -hmm. and I was survived. That's how I was going to because I wanted to be a police officer, but I didn't want to be there in Austin, but I was going to come back. And that's what, that was my roadblock. Mm -hmm. Like, I come to a friend over here, and everybody here, like, oh, the avid reader, oh, Mark is here trying to say all this fucking way out. I didn't, I, and I stuffed it in. I was like, I'm trying to be clever. So my, my wife said, okay, drive in your car, and then we're just going to mix up. I'm going to put right. mine in your luggage. And, you know, mm -hmm. and they won't have to speak too because, you know, you drive, you know. Hey, throw your wife on the bus. I mean, yeah, I, I, hey. mean, you know, she didn't, she didn't know what I was doing. And, and I'd be dead. I guess that was God attempt, you know, slap me on the wrist because I end up getting stopped anyway. Stopped <laughs> I can believe it. I had it. a doja with my cousin, so they still sort of linger on me. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They stopped me. Nothing, no problem, nothing in my damn car. Tore the, tore the hell out of my car. Nothing was there, but it still gave me a chance. So then I ended up not feeling good. I signed up to change my major and all kind of shit happened. I couldn't even get work in legal while I was trying to do because that wow. was still going through all record, this stuff. Yeah. Bugs against junk driving and all these damn classes and stuff just to make sure. And that was the worst thing. That, 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 Gave me a bad taste in my fucking ball. Like, okay, I know they're. Like, I see them. People go to flock that damn weed thing all the time, and they're not getting stopped. And even though you knew I was going to school for this and that, they still didn't care. And we still have law enforcement who are wholly ignorant of our medical program. And we have we have Plano PD on video outside of one of the dispensing organizations, um, making a comment saying, you know, I couldn't. This place has to be hot. There's no way this is legal. And and, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a state sanctioned yeah. program, so then yeah. you have to call in DPS to say, you know, can you please yeah, get local right. law enforcement right. and explain to them this is an actual legitimate program. So yeah, that's, that's a crazy. question. That's crazy that they don't know. I mean, that's the issue. I had to go talk to, um, I actually got a call from, I had a patient who was pregnant, and, um, you know, a lot of moms still smoke cannabis because they, they get nausea and vomiting, they don't want to take medicine, and so CPS called me. First, I thought I was, I was in trouble. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> and they were just like, you know, we had this lady who, positive you know how they can they can just test you without your permission and she was positive and 
this in CPS, like, you know, the whole department had no idea that it was legal, even though you guys are popping people. So I actually had to go speak to them because they were like, they had no idea. That, first they were like, oh, you can smoke and still have be pregnant? Like, yeah, actually you can. Like, you know, it's better than a lot of medication. Mm -hmm. And then so, and so I feel like Texas just, just lacks just any motivation to even like spread the word. Like, you know, like when I first, that's how I started doing it. I didn't even know I could prescribe cannabis until some random person came off. So I was like, I could do this? And that was like three years ago. I had no idea because doctors aren't talking about it either. Nobody and so that. there's no education. Right, if it's, yeah, and, that, and that's a big problem too. Just like the education itself will help push it forward, especially medically, right? When you have a couple of us doctors talking and getting out here, but without the full support of the healthcare field, of healthcare, of you know, everybody, operators, nurses, doctors, facilities, period, right? Like that's also, I think, why it's going so slow. Um, well, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, and we're going to get to the, you, Dr. Rosier, here in a second, and that, that uh, is going to bleed right into it. The cops can pull you over and they smell cannabis it gives them a reason to search right why does that give them a reason is it what is the probable cause of that and how do we how do we change laws in order for that not to be used anymore? well they are changing um, quite re there have been several states and I'm not a criminal attorney so I'll, I'll have to check what the latest appellate level decision on this was but there have been a lot of states that are moving toward the fact that simply the smell alone is no longer probable cause because hemp right. has been yeah. pretty much federally legalized mm -hmm. but there's a there's a funny little um, it's two attorneys and they're criminal defense attorneys and they made a song when Texas first passed the hemp program and it's called it goes like is it hemp or is it weed is the THC over point three you don't know. <laughs> OG Kush in the car, then, and they say, you know, are you smoking cannabis? You right. you say, first off, you don't say anything, but if you feel compelled to say something, you know, nope, it's him. Yep. The burden yeah. is on them to go say. back and test it and prove. Yeah. And the test, tested backlog is so far behind right now, that's one of their least concerns. The cannabis offenses they're prosecuting on are people who are like, oh, yeah, that's pot, you know. Um, but there are also things criminal defense attorneys can do on the testing side to mitigate the risk for you. So that's a brilliant song. It gets on YouTube. Yeah. I'll check it out. Uh, check it out. Uh, it's uh, amazing uh, how you can, you, you know, you can make handkerchiefs, clothing, and things like that. Clothing, it just plastics. Yeah, I got a bag right now, a huge bag that is all of him. I don't, I don't think I want to get wickers. I think the little bugs. Are, but it's the most durable little thing, and it, it looks like tweed or. Like make a rope that holds like ten tons. Oh, yeah. Like hemp is like really, really strong. strong. So it's it's, it, it was used in World War Two, World War Colo One, the Colonial, Civil War. Colonial yeah. times. So the reason the why we first... call ourselves Hemp for Victory is because Hemp for Victory was actually put on at the end of World War yeah, Two. Japan blocked all of our uh, supply lines from China that we would use to make sales ropes right. and other types of canvas. So in in nineteen forty. Four, I believe, or 43, hemp for victory became a uh, thing. They wanted all the farmers to start growing hemp so that they could, for the war effort. And they allowed them to do it. Yeah. As soon as the war was over, obviously yeah, it I mean, stopped. Yeah, hemp, I mean, hemp's been used, like, since, I do a lot of like, my speaking about this, like, hemp's been used since ancient times. And, like, think about this, like, you know, colonial times, right? Like, before our country was, was even, you know, built, they were doing hemp. But what product do you think came that pushed them out the way that can do the same thing hemp can do for clothes, for textiles? What was the most popular thing? in 1800s, cotton. So cotton, they were like, so they were making so much money on cotton, they, that it was purposeful to push out hemp because we were out here plucking away, making this economy great. And hemp, was, and hemp wasn't that because they're sending cotton all over the world, right? So they pushed out all the cotton fields, I mean hemp fields, turned into cotton fields. And the cotton gin got, then the cotton gin got invented and right cotton gin came out, it was over. Abraham Lincoln did the thing. We'd be wearing right jeans thing. with hemp right now yeah. if it wasn't for that. So you know. Let me also blow your mind. Your great great grandma did cannabis. I guarantee you. Your great grandma, your great grandfather, because well, yeah. in the 1860s, it was the predominant pharmaceutical medicine that you would get in the then version of CVS and Walgreens. It, it was wasn't called cannabis. As well. It yeah. became so popular. We had our own strain. It was called cannabis Americana. Mm -hmm. It was used for cold relief, for menstrual pain relief, Not for marijuana. insomnia. Yeah. Cannabis Americana. Um, you can find old his, but you know, part of the, one of the things I love to do is collect old historical cannabis bottles that cool. your grandma and grandfather would actually go in and buy. That's one of the reasons why I wanted you. A lot of times, I can tell you what I can ask a million vets. I'm going to tell you almost every single one of them. Do you wake up in pain every day? Every day do you have bill of pain? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Like, like yeah. you know, my shoulders. I can't even. I, I, in bed, I can see. Now I. 
Right? It's like I'm not even comfortable. I don't even want to sleep now. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. unless I just doze off, un you know, unconsciously. It's like, oh God, I sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's getting that bad, and it's gonna it's gonna screw me up. It is because pain requires a ton of energy for your body to regulate. Yeah, yeah it does. I mean, it, but it sucks because I mean, we can start from the beginning. Like right now, is pain a diagnosis for medical marijuana right now? No, it's not. Is chronic pain one? No, it's not. Is your arthritis one? No, it's not. Is your sleep a diagnosis? No, it's not. Yeah, it was doctor yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't pick. I mean, if you have PTSD, I can treat you, and I can treat everything else because you have PTSD. If you have cancer, I can treat you. If you have, if you have epilepsy and seizures and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, I can treat you. But, but I can't pick out these other things for you yet because the program's so small, you know? I mean, but like for me, for pain, I've been treating people for pain for the last like three years with cannabis because I get them in for like neuropathy, like nerve pain, right? So usually people have back pain, they have like shooting pain down their legs too. Numbness, tingling, that sensation, that's neuropathy. That's allowed right now. And so most people that have some type of arthritis usually have some type of nerve pain, and I can pull that diagnosis out usually to get them the, me the medical marijuana. But you, know, but, you know, the thing is that this too, you know, so cannabis and THC, the THC, CBD, they attach so well to those receptors, pain receptors, those nerves. Like the majority of your receptors you have in your body for cannabis, like in your brain, your spinal cord nerves, and your gut. That's why it works so well for like anxiety and tension and stress and like stomach issues and relax, you know, mentation and mood because it goes right to it. And, um, you know, for me, like seeing, especially with the opiate pandemic coming out, like, you know, when it, was, it blew up and I was in the last, you know, five, six years I've been a pain doctor, I was, you know, you gotta, you gotta, trying to find ways to mitigate and to improve just the overall effects. So I can get somebody with, with, with Percocet or, or hydrocodone, right? Like most people, when they take cannabis too, are bringing down the medicine they're on, right? I mean, they're they're coming down on pain medicine, they're coming down on anti-anxiety medicine, they're coming down on depression medicine, you know? So I take care of a lot of vets with PTSD, a ton. And um, I, t I tell you, like a lot of them are on so much crap and then they they just stop. So when usually when I talk to them, they're on nothing, usually. And that a very bad spot. Like I, I got guys, you know, you know, Marines and whatever, like special, for I mean, everybody. And you know these guys are sitting around just like I just don't feel like doing anything. I get like I, n I understand what that does to you: nightmares, anxiety, um, lack of motivation, all that stuff. And what they tell me a lot of times is like they don't say like the, you know I ask them you know how, how do you feel like you know what is your what is this doing for you? And most times they say I don't feel sad anymore. I don't feel sad, which allows them to start doing more stuff. I'm running again. I'm working out. I don't hate my my life, I don't hate my family anymore, I'm better with them, my sex life is better. And because I think the biggest thing is just mood. Because even if you don't feel better physically, the way you approach your pain improves. The way you approach your day improves. Like I have chronic pain patients who are really hard up, like with really bad back problems, right? But how, why is it some people can really like, you know, maneuver through that and other folks can't, you know? It's, that, it's how you feel about it, right? And so with cannabis even making your mood better, it's easier to really kind of kind of move through life too, you know, so. That's, 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 that's good to know. Yeah. I think a lot of my needs are fixing from long term me ignoring it. So I didn't know it until I was much, much grown. And, and it's more than just me having seizures at night that I feel like I can control, but can't, you know, if I get upset at work or whatever, it seems like, if I have a good calm day, then I won't wake up with body pains. Right. Extreme headaches. Can't see. Stress. Because I wake, you know, you know, my I keep me all messed up with grinding, grinding and everything from the seizure. I don't even know I'm having. What kind of seizure you have? So methadone they tell me I'm, it's like they come multi, they come uh, in threes. What methods you go to? Down down? Uh, methods I'm actually in sugar. Okay. Uh, because uh, when I was saying, and that's what made me back home to Dallas from Houston, because I had no support. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I die in my apartment in Houston, nobody would be able to find me. You know? See, it's not as lovely because that incident I told you I had with my friend. I was at his place and I was like having a stressful weed. Yeah. Instead of this place, and that's when it was like, it scared the hell out yeah. of me. So, I, no, not prescribed. No. I've been doing it. I mean, you, you can be, uh, you can be a patient. I, at that and other stuff. So that's what that I will. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I have quite a few seizure patients. I had a lady who got seizures who was pregnant. She was 
take a cannabis like like the tinctures here. Too, like it's limited, right? It's only oral. There's no nothing. You can't smoke. We're working on that yeah. because, like, so I I work with the dispensing organizations, and DPS is is very. We need higher authorities' permission to do it because, right. like, we would love to get a pulmonary inhalation method that's not smokable, right. like an asthmatic inhaler. The dispensing organizations are very aware that you know it's causing that diarrhea needed, and some of the issues yeah. with yeah, pediatric What's patients the too. Like, working on it. It's the amount you got to take. That you yeah. got to take to get it. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like because their tinctures mostly are oil based, yep. and so because it's not because we have that that one percent by volume rule still, like whatever you get, like that little bottle of yours is full of oil. So if it's 300 milligrams, and most people need more than like 60, 70 a day, if they're really kind of like, you know, like, like really down with, with, with disease, you're taking a lot of oil in your mouth, right? Like so a full C, like, like a, it's a dropper, right? So a full CC of that is like 10 milligrams. Well, if you need like 60 a day, you know how much oil that is in your stomach? Like how you was even, and the gummies are okay, but it's hard to even like, my issue with gummies is that you can't really, me it's hard to measure gummies, right? Like if I cut it in half, I don't know specifically how much is in that half. And I can't even cut it straight, right? So you can't really measure it well, right? And so you don't really know how much you're getting. And so, and so because people got, I'm taking care of people that have actual GI problems, throat issues. What well, if you got throat cancer? You know what I'm saying? And you can't inhale it, you gotta swallow something? I'm working on it. So thank you. <laughs> working we so need, hard we need on flour this. so bad. Like we need flour to be able to like be able to prescribe flour for people. This um, is I think this is a fascinating topic, first off. And I'm gonna tell you why. People are tend to say that flour is not really something that's medical, right? Because you gotta smoke it. But the idea that and that's one of the things I prefer, I prefer flour. I'm sorry about that. I prefer flour. I am a old school guy, right? I come from I'm Gen X, old school, roll it. Yeah. Um, but how many of your patients that you get have pain problems, but also are on a uh, psych psychiatric drug? Almost all of them. I mean, so and that's the key with me because I try to like try to separate the two. Yeah. I say, you know, you take your cannabis first and see how you can how far out you can push out your medicine, right? It's the goal. But most people are because these psychiatrists just dump paint like just dump meds on you on you guys in the VA. Like I see it all the time. Like why are you on like four or five different antidepressants and anxiety medications? And the problem is, it doesn't get you better. It's like pain medicine. Right. I ask people all the time, are you better? You're, you've been on this medicine for 20 years. Is your life better? And it's usually no, yeah. right? Because it doesn't improve your function. It doesn't, it doesn't let you do more, live life better. All these medicines do is just kind of lower your energy of life, really. You know, like they sedate you, they make you feel out of sorts, you don't feel like yourself. And, then, and, it, and it's just medicine. And then once you get this other medicine, now you got some side effect. Now you got tardive dyskinesia, you're like, you, mouse, you ever see someone like mouse moving all the time? It's from antipsychotics. Now you got, now you're walking like this, and now you gotta get, now you gotta put on anti-anxiety medicine and calm your mouth down. You know what I'm saying? So now you're on fucking, now you're on lorazepam, Wellbutrin. You know what I'm saying? And so, and it's never ending. Whereas I just feel like they, I mean, we all know that cannabis covers so many different things, right? So I just feel like a lot of times too, these pharmaceutical companies are so against this because they know what's going to happen if cannabis became so big. Because you take away so many, so many drugs, Tylenol, aspirin like itching medicine, stomach medicine, headache medicine, sleep medicine. Like, you know how much stuff this covers? So we were talking about Adderall <laughs> and Ambien. Because that's why, I swear she's a, she's a she, she's just strung out on it because she takes the- Oh what, Addy? Adderall, yeah. she, she, and she'll take, and she'll abuse it. And when the doctor's like, okay, I can't do you no more, she'll turn around because she's in the surgical work hospital. Right. She'll go get French me, which yeah. is places. And then she doesn't even eat as it is anyway, she's a believer. Yeah. So now she's really not eating. Yeah. And then just for her, because of all that, she has to take, she's got both of them. Adderall, she's got the Ambien and the Sumatra or whatever. Yeah, she can't the sleep because she's on Adderall all day. Yeah, so she's got to take the four hour surgery, depending on where I'm. Mm -hmm. So she's got a pill, she takes Colazepam to reduce that. Yeah. All that yeah. She gets stressed out. So she's got a pill for everything. I was like, oh my God, I'm married to the most. So. Give her some cannabis, she'll eat. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't want to, you know. She didn't want to try it. Well, when she did try it, I want to give her. Yeah, it's amazing me how people are afraid to like, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm like, you were on everything. Do you think that maybe people don't want to try it because they're able to handle what it is they have, even though they really can't, and any change like that is too scary? I think it's a stigma. Like, I talked to my mom about, like, my mom is 67, 68, and, like, you know, I'd been doing this for a long time. She sees what I'm doing. She sees my posts. I send her stuff. I wrote a book. Like, she's like, and she's still like, 
and I'm gonna do drugs. I'm like, mom, but but you but you just drank a half a bottle of like Maker's Mark like at this party. Are you serious? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I think so. I think that stigma that was built into a lot of the generations from like the 60s, 70s, 80s, like really holds. Well, it is 100. percent It holds. I mean, they scared them. I think I'm in like, the 80s yeah. when I was mm. growing up, my parents were scared to death that somebody with one joint could kill a kid. It's the burning or, weed of hell with its root, or the burning weed of the devil with its roots in hell. Yeah. Like they were, yeah. this is We were I, Southern Baptists too. That's, no, but what and I love to, yeah. when I go out and speak, a lot of people don't know about the, the true propaganda reasons right. behind the prohibition of cannabis. Like there's something called the Anslinger Files where Henry Anslinger, and who was terrible. responsible, he was terrible. He was responsible for alcohol prohibition. He went out and found some of those violent crimes in America and then falsified the fact that they were connected to marijuana because when he moved for cannabis, the American Medical Association, the American Veterinary Association, they showed out in droves in Congress um, back in the 40s and 50s saying, no, absolutely, this should not be, um, they actually were pushing for it to be regulated like alcohol. So he had to pivot and he created this thing called the gateway theory. I mean, it's a tribute to him where they started selling this lie that cannabis is a gateway drug. It will lead you to darker drugs that all this influx and violent crime was solely attributable to cannabis. There was certainly the racist element behind the original scheduling. And so everything, I, it's funny, I tell my office, I'm like, if I had more time, I would do like a big YouTube documentary series on all of this. Because if people realize the amount of lies that they were directly fed about this plant, which has been used medicinally, again, in developed nations like Israel that ran some of the first clinicals on this nearly 100 years ago, people would be angry that you were denied access. Right. It's funny thing, thing to too, you look at history, whenever we uh, came out of the prohibition of alcohol, right, put a lot of people who were in charge of busting people for making alcohol out of business, right? Mm -hmm. So now all these sheriffs and everything else needed something to do. Mm -hmm. Well, conveniently, marijuana was right there to be illegal just a few years later, and they got something they could do. It's, there, yeah. This is, um, it was never about health. It was never about civility. Yeah. It was never about anything more than power. Yeah, like Anslinger li like literally said, he was like, cannabis makes um, black people think they feel, think they're equal to us. Um, when he saw th blacks and whites like hanging out and like in the East Coast, jazz clubs, b like b like bars, jazz, smoking, uh, there was a term smoke. Yeah, it's called like jazz. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it. And he was like. I, we can't have this. Y'all can be hanging out. This is making y'all too close. And so then he started saying that ca cannabis makes black people wild and, and loose and rebellious. I knew the Mexicans get murderous. It was a derogatory name yeah, as well yeah, for the yeah, jazz because yeah, that yes. was part of that his part propaganda of that he tied into it. And There's literally so connected a connected to that. And then, then that's when the whole, you know, and at that point, the world was pretty racist, though. I mean, you know, it was like, so, it was pretty racist, right, America, back, right, right? So then he's like, so, so what do you think, what do you think was, was, was gonna happen when you go, oh, well, you know, oh, he's murdering, he's murdering, it's because of can cannabis. Just flew forward, you know, so. There's actually That's a written idea. quote from, I need to, <laughs> that and a doctor C L I. There's a quote from, um, Nixon's domestic policy advisor, like the head of domestic policy advice to the president. And he says, you know, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Absolutely, yes we did. But we used the drugs and the way we portrayed them as a way to go after black and Hispanic mm -hmm. communities. I mean, he says it right yeah, out, like it's on tape. Um, <laughs> and I can tell I got friends of mine that have been in, in, uh, in the military. They've done different things. Some, some guys have been in the Navy, Coast Guard, and they've run drug trafficking. And that was their job. My job was to go across seas and fight over there. Their job was to protect, and they worked all the Nicaraguan and things of that nature. They would but make big busts, right? And the drugs would come out, cocaine and marijuana, and they would take portions of it, put it on a completely different boat, and ship it off. And the rest of it would go to get destroyed. And I remember my buddy asked one time, and this is what changed his mind about, about weed, because he thought, it was, he was sold to everything. I said, you know, that's what he did. He busted drug, he was a drug bust. He, he went in there, burnt f uh, farms and everything like that. He saw that would go away and he's like, wait, where's this, where's that thing going? And his Catherine was like, oh, that's ours, that's Americans. Underprivileged community. Yeah. The so they would, they would tell me that in order for, you know, the United States to really be in and, and have a good uh, understanding of what's going on in the drug trade, they need to be a part of the drug trade. 
So these were trackers, right? And they, they used the marijuana to, to keep themselves abreast of the drug trade. Now, if they take and legalize marijuana, there's no reason for the drug, tra drug traffickers to ship it, right? The drug traffickers don't really give a shit one way or the other if marijuana is illegal over here in the United States or not. As long as it's illegal, they're going to keep doing it. Once it becomes legal, they'll find something else. They've been looking at other places for, I mean, they got, the, the cartels have everything else they want as far as the illegality. They don't really give it too much. They're not making a ton of money off marijuana. The only, the only people that are making a lot of money off marijuana are the dispensaries that sell half their products to the open group, everybody who's coming in, and the rest of <laughs> the rest goes, out the goes, goes out the back door. Yeah, because that's, that's the way they have to do right it. Now. And I don't, you know, I want to cut that part out. But my point is, is that that's, that's just the, that's the truth. You can't have interstate commerce. We can't trade. We can't do the things that we can do over there. It's not treated like every other uh, industry. And so because of that, a lot of people just don't know. And then when they come to Dr. Rosier and he's talking to them about these pain problems they have and they have all these medical uh, issues that have mental health and now they're on 17 pills. How are you supposed to, at 80 years old, manage 17 pills yeah. when you know you can't take certain ones close to each other? Well, you can't mix them. And you can't mix them. It's so confusing with people, man. I mean, so how, for a pain doctor, and how do you deal with, with uh, people who have a large amount of, of, of pain meds that need to be very strictly regulated on a day-to-day -day basis? How, how do you work with them? And when they move to cannabis, what change do you see in their daily I mean, it people, like, they want to get off. Like, it's crazy how many people, people think everybody here is an addict. Like, a lot of people don't want to take a lot of opiates. Right. Like, so these people come to me, like, most times when they come to cannabis, because they want to drop down. Most of them aren't, like, doing it because they just want more drugs. And so, which is great. I mean, so, because they, because they realize everybody, everybody here is not trying to sell hydrocodone and oxycotton like that. Like people get on it and they like, I don't want any more. Or, do drop down. Is that, yeah, yeah. Almost everybody I take care of drops down my, or gets off. How many people uh, come to you that, that aren't really looking for cannabis? They're just looking for an answer to their problem. Well, usually like, see, I mean a lot, but like, you know, I was a, I'm a, I have a paying practice. So if I recognize things that might be better for cannabis, I bring it up to them. But most people come to me to, to my actual, most people don't come to my pain clinic because they don't know. And so like my, most of my patients have no idea. I have posters on my walls, but so if they call my company, the Arc Medical that we do it through, they already know. But most of my patients I see in my practice in Mansfield, they have no idea. Does your contract prohibit you? Because I have an, an, like an ER attending. Well, I have my own practice. No, but I mean like I see you've got a Methodist thing on there. Yeah. So like when you're at Methodist, yeah. does your contract I'm prohibit a, you from yeah, telling well, people? I'm, a, I'm just affiliated. So this is like my badge just going to the hospital. So I have nothing to do, like I'm not, I, have, I can do what I want, but yeah, I see what you're saying. If I, was, if, I was, if I was technically employed or contracted with them, that'd be a totally different story. They're not allowed to, so I was actually shocked to learn that. I, I have a, um, a good friend of mine who's an ER attending physician who has his own private practice for cannabis, but when he is on the floor of the ER, if he has someone with like a severe opioid addiction come in, his contract with the hospital oh, says he cannot tell them that yeah. there is a medical marijuana yeah. alternative. Actually, I've had ER doctors send me patients. It's, I know even doctors on the floor of the hospital wow. send me like patients, so. Uh, group or something like that, that. It's a private hospital. Private, here, they can do what they want. Yeah. And do what they want. If they don't want to, they don't want to talk about it, you, you can't talk about it. And which is crazy, right? Because you rather send them out on pain medicine, but you don't want to give them a good alternative though instead. So you when, you, when you prescribe pain, uh, cannabis for pain, what kind of time period do you see when you start seeing results, positive results? Well, yeah, I tell people, like, you know, it takes a while. Everybody's different um, because most people kind of got to figure out what their dosing is because the goal is to go kind of as high as you can without feeling, like, intoxicated, right, or high, whatever. And so, but I tell people, give it always at least two months because you got because you got to go up incrementally. I don't have people, so I tell you, every week you might increase by five, ten milligrams, depending on how you're doing, or if you got to get used to that space. So around, I say around anywhere between two to three months. As we really feel now, like the initial stuff, right? Like you, you know, you, you're, you're more relaxed quicker. Um, you know, the, the, you're, you're, you know, obviously, if you need to eat, that happens. You can sleep better. Anxiety's less. But those long-term mood, PTSD things, things that are more need to be more regulated, takes longer, right? Your nerves take a long time to heal, right? And so, nerve pain takes months, right? Um, but things, things like pain in general, just pain by itself, is better almost like in the first week, right? right. Then I got people who have like chemo neuropathy. They're, they got a big old tumor somewhere, or get cancer, they're taking, they're taking chemotherapy, they burn their nerves. And so we do it sometimes during chemo, so they do it, and then they do it after chemo. And that, I've seen like four or five months, it begins to get better with them too. But things like PTSD, stuff like that, man, like, like a month, month and a half, because like the mood is what the big thing is, right? Yeah, yeah you, you might have some receptors that are set, because people who are sick, 
usually have an imbalance of their cannabinoid system, like the system where the cannabis goes to. So a lot of times those people have like an upregulation of those receptors, so they have to be filled. So once they're filled, it's not like they're high, they're just balanced out, because right. now that key, that lock and key is more complete on more of the cells in your body, right? And so that's why people tend to not get high when they're sick, or they have like a diagnosis that's serious because they're not, they're not getting extra, they're getting enough. <laughs> so we all have an incannabinoid system. Do you know what an incannabinoid system is in your body? Uh, yeah. To look at the receptors? Yeah. Well, see, yeah. that's one yeah. of the things. Mm -hmm. that, Dr. Mm -hmm. talk about the incannabinoid system. Everybody yeah. has one, and it was discovered in the yeah. early 90s, and yeah. most people don't even realize they have it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, so, like, you have, like, this in... So remember, like, you have, like, this, like, this endogenous, like, already in your body system for it, right? So, I mean, there, you have a small amount kind of already circling your, in your bloodstream, right, from, like, other plants, other foods, right? But, but specifically for cannabis with these cannabinoids, you know, it was discovered that, wait, wait a second, like, you know, if I smoke or eat this, this actually goes to a place in my body, right? So the system is in place to not just downregulate things in your body, like, you know, mood and, you know, how, how you feel, but also upregulates. And so this system actually works in, in tangent with other things in your body too. That's why when people s use the whole plant versus separated CBD, THC, they get a better result because you're putting, they, they call it the entourage effect, right? Because there's multiple types of cannabinoids, not just CBD, but C CBG, right? And CBA, those, those ones, right? That connect to different ones. And they all work together to help, each, to help each other go up or down, right? And so, and the majority of my said before, right, is in your nervous system and your gut. That's where a lot of those, those receptors are. And so we discovered that if you can balance those out for people, that medically they improve, you know? Um, some people have more, some people have less, right? But the, the key is to kind of find that balance, you know? And so that's why certain people respond to certain strains differently because each one has different, has different effects, where it's the, the, uh, the flavonoids or the, you know, or the, um, or the terpenes, right? Like limonene, those, those ones, right? Like lemon, limonene, limonene is great for infl inflammation. Mm -hmm. So that you, you smell a lemon, you know how some cannabis has scents of other fruits and other nuts and berries? It's because they connect. What, what, we mean? Oh, they all have scents. Oh, they all have terpene for a while. If you really smell, yeah, and if you mm -hmm. smoke it too, sometimes you can, you can definitely like, you can taste the different yeah. plants in it, you know? And so that's, that's why it's beautiful. That's why fruit and vegetables are so, that's why herb, because like, what is, what is cannabis? It's an herb, technically, right? Like, when the, what does the Bible say about, you know, it said go and partake of all the herbs of the earth, right? Even God said that, right? So what I'm saying <laughs> is that, that. <laughs> I'm serious though, like, it's an herb. Your grandma used herbs, we use herbs. Herbs are so good for your body, you know? And so we find that it has, it's got a natural connection, physio like, physiologically, to almost every single, like, you know, system in your body. Do you find that a lot of your patients, or a lot of people that you see coming in, they, they're, they're out of balance? Yeah. In that, and I, I found that too, once I was started to kind of balance out my body, I was able to get back into the gym, and I became far more excited about being healthy. Right. And when you walk around high, were you walking around high? Yeah. Yeah, or no? No, no, I mean, when I'm walking. yeah. When you, when, 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 you take it, when you take it, yeah. Like, do you feel more even, or do you feel like you're high? No, I usually feel a little bit more balanced. Unless I take a lot of it, then I really feel high. And that's normally but at the you night. Know, you know, there's a yeah, I feel good. Like I'll to get to without feeling intoxicated. Though. Exactly. I know exactly what I'm doing, exactly. where I'm going. I have everything. Exactly. And I, you know, I'm going through my day. Uh, I find that just the right amount. Uh, I, I know no more pain, no more aggravation, and I'm able to continue my day as as it's supposed to be. A lot of veterans. Are, are, you know, they leave the military pretty, pretty much in shape and they try to stay in shape throughout there. And they start getting on pain pills and that takes them off that course and then they try to get back onto it. But I've found that a lot of vets like to use it and, and work out at the same time. Whether well, it's the same time or vets, afterwards. That's just vets, yeah. that's vets, athletes. Yeah, and I've seen that with athletes because I, 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 like I said, I do this thing with Recovery. merging vets and players. Yeah. I don't know if y'all have heard of that. It's a, I remember I was telling you. It's an organization called MVP, it's Merging Vets and Players. They take veterans and, and professional athletes and they do a workout and then afterwards you do a little powwow. It's great, I'm going for eight weeks, I love it. And one of the things there I noticed is that almost all the athletes use it. 
because they find that the recovery on there is so much better on for their for their muscles. Why is that? What is it about cannabis that makes recovery on your muscles so much better? Well, one thing does it decreases your, your inflammation, mm -hmm. right? Right. So like not only are so you got to think about like what is a what is what is working out is it's a breakdown of muscle fibers right and so you have little 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 breaks little capillaries break right little muscle fibers break what, what happens something breaks though right your body sends chemicals to inflame it that's where the that's where the soreness and pain comes comes from right but literally THC and CBD it goes to those receptors so CBD actually locks on to that gateway of pain and it turns down the receptor that's why THC is so strong and then CBD locks onto the, to those nerves, right? So the reception of that pain is also decreased too. So not only is the actual inflammation decreased from cannabis physiologically, so is your response to it. And so, right, and so, and so that's why also you feel better because your body literally, your body literally is decreasing that down faster, you know? And so, and they also do, and you also feel better. People also talk about how when they, they, they take cannabis and work out, there, there's a different kind of focus. Mm -hmm. So because you can feel, because you can feel your body differently, yeah. people talk about how like there's a different mind muscle connection. Absolutely. Like you might have a, people have excellent workouts when they smoke because you, because people tell, people say they can feel their muscles better, connect to it better. And they ain't, they ain't high working out. Just, just oh. they take it's a little a bit. It's a focus you get that's yeah. different. And, you know. About 90 days ago, they identified the actual neuron receptor in the brain that causes mm -hmm. the appetite increase in fact. So when it's rescheduled into Schedule 3 and becomes much more available for um, research, we'll be able to, to make very targeted therapeutic applications. I'm super excited yeah, about because like for, you know, that focus, you want to take a sativa focus strain. If it's the evening and you want to relax, usually an, an indica based strain is going to work a little bit See, for I you like or some hybrid. hybrid. Hybrids who I've been smoking since they, and like, I had, I thought I broke this in my Achilles and it was like right in my heel. Tore it. Yeah. And I, all I did was something stupid, I jumped down or something, I saw a roach and I like, I was clean. <laughs> and I was on like, I was on my, on my wash and dryer, saw a roach, I just did this, this, this combat, <laughs> like, like, more, you know, Mortal Kombat thing, just jumped right down. As soon as I jumped down on it, I just crumbled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Finish him and they finished me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, and I smoked so much back then. And this is like 18. And they say, oh my God, it was a side fracture. So the advisor had those pins or whatever. And it healed so quick. And they didn't understand what I was doing. I was like, oh, no. They were I, I told my, with my grandparents, they never, they, they were all yeah, cultures, so they grew everything. Yeah. Like, right. to greens and that. And we get, like, we get a headache, go take like 12 or 15 almonds. Drink some water. I like okay. that's it. Yeah, they would do it like that. Never take nothing. You know, mm -hmm. that's why I, when I'm surprised when they were so against, and I was shoving from the family just doing weed. I'm like, oh my God, we're yeah. just you're doing drugs. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna do drugs. We're taking one trip for you, not gonna be. So I was like, okay, I don't. So, but it's helped me in so many ways with just those two things. And, and doctor, I, I hope I can build it talk because. What I'm getting a uh, grass of now, this is gonna give me a long, long chance of life. What I have dealt with, I lost mother in, in 08. I had my first nervous breakdown. I didn't even know how I had it. You don't even remember it happened. It was like the dream. I woke exactly. up, next to my hands were on the back of the police car and I lost sway. And apparently, I had a break and I was at a friend's house and I just took off running. Next thing you know, uh, you know, I was running in the middle of the street at night. And the police saw me, I, I must have ran. He said, probably point two or something that just yelling out at night. Yeah. But um the doctor gave me this is where my insomnia started happening and all this sleep. They gave me Wellbutrin and Lunesta. They said, oh something to control that and something to help you sleep. And ever since then I've not slept. Right. And I, I it's like it, it made me worse. And I it, but smoking when I started smoking after that, that's what's kind of helped me say balance, but yeah. I'm still not able to find my balance in a sense because I don't so I don't do it for necessarily for pain or like that. So I just do it now mm -hmm. until I get to that point. But then by that time I didn't smoke myself to oblivion. Quick question. So going from um, you said the black market versus going through yourself, what is the benefit of Going the issues like you know is just is the regulation right now. I think like you, you, you're hearing stories now of like products making people sick, like really sick, you know, from cannabis to mushrooms to everything else. I mean, the, the market's so saturated with things that are really not tested as well, 
That, that's so that, that's the one thing. Secondly, people are pumping out product for money. Yeah. Secondly, you're safe. Like, you know, like, like he said, like this, like you're in the Department of Public Safety. So if you were caught, even though you might have issues, they just got to call the Public Safety Department. And you're you're you're, you're like you're my patient. Like you're not going to go to jail because this is legal for you. Like that bottle is your prescription. You know. Um, two is it like I, I can tell you where it comes from. I can tell you how I can tell you if I trust it or not. I don't I, I don't. There's a lot of stuff out there right now people are selling that really is unsafe. Um, pesticides, chemicals. Aspergillus right? on right. flowers Fung sold fungus. in downtown Austin. Fung yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> live I, I flower. That. Funguses. You said aspergillus. Yeah. Funguses. yeah. If it's you have a respiratory, yeah, and if you have pre-existing respiratory conditions, it can kill you. It's called a giant ball fungus. It's called asper aspergillosis. It's a giant fungus ball in your lungs. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you can breathe that in or you can eat it like you smell it, breathe it in and it'll get in your lungs and be like a big, big, a huge gross ball that will cause like really bad pulmonary dysfunction, like breathing issues. So. Heavy metals, pesticides, toxins. So the benefit of being in the testing. medical program, you, most people don't know this and you may not either. Medical program is actually tested twice. People don't know that the state of Texas sends the products out of state to another analytical testing laboratory. So they're and, and indeed, by the time they leave the facility, they've actually been tested four times because they've gone right. through all R&D validation, product approval with DPS, yeah. outside testing and validation. And these are medical grade facilities. They're following pharmaceutical yeah. GMP regulations. I can tell you with precision what is in some of my clients' medications. A lot of these products that are in some of these, uh, you know, hemp stores, yeah, in the head shops and stuff, you would be very surprised what testing shows is in them. I mean, so it's so funny. After I found, and I, I'll find you because I've been for a long time. Like I found this this uh, uh, one in Houston that found it became really big on this this this, this tent. The Edwards marijuana family. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, you know exactly. Edwards, right? And then they have this kid here in Grand Prairie, this little Asian kid with this deep, raspberry voice. I'm thinking, okay, he's got a nice little army. I said, he's all done. I'm like, I don't, I'm not buying you. You know, literally. Mm -hmm. um, so I, now I find myself now pulling away from it. And because of that, that's why I'm having a short black guy. What state programs out there that you think really have it down when it comes to regulating in the, in the, the patient or the customer knowing what they're getting? Oh, a lot. Most mm -hmm. medical regimes um, Regico, on the medical see. side. Well, I call it regime <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it's so stringent. There's no <clears> medical yeah. program in the nation that doesn't require stringent mm -hmm. testing, labeling, yeah. external validations. Um, you know, recreational, certainly not. They're not subjected to the same standards, but there's not, I mean, if I had to hold up a program example as the worst in the entire United States, I know who I'd, I know oh, yeah, who I'd be holding up. You know, you know like those, those bottles, like you, you get, get a package and it's got a barcode on there? Like that barcode is like, it's kind of like a universal standard. So like if you can't, if you, if you put your phone in that barcode and you don't get a good list of where it's tested, the levels in it, right? It's not a good product. You know, and so, and it should be pretty thorough. But if you buy what? it at the store and you're scanning the QR code, you're gonna get a cannabinoid potency profile that may have been on the first mm -hmm. batch test that they mm -hmm. did. When you are using a medical application, my clients can scan that and not only tell you what's in that medication, they can identify the bay and the number mm -hmm. from the mother plant that that extract yeah. came off of. That's how highly traceable it is i mean it's like it's like, it's like, it's like any yeah. drug you buy on the street now it's your risk you risk killing yourself they're meaning pharmaceutical yourself. applications yeah so yeah. um i mean and you see i'm sure you people will lace cannabis with fentanyl and, and other and that's the that's the biggest so the fear that we have in the state of texas is that because the medical program is not very good at all and it's expensive it's hard to get to you don't even have a card it. you have to get a prescription <laughs> you start to go to the black market now i Pretty sure that a lot of people out there getting the, trying to get to the black market. A lot of their guys are sketchy, yeah. right? Very few credible people out there. Now, I will tell you, I've talked to a lot of cops, and one of the things they tell me that there's a specific demographic of in cannabis between the people who are using it as medicine and the people that are using it for a drug and a recreational. He said the ones that are using it as, as medicine, we we don't have problems with. They don't. They don't stick out. They don't become an issue. And even if even if they have it on them, it's it's they're, it's just not something we concern ourselves with because it's only that. 
Well, they don't end up having to, like, you know, I was just discussing this with you. They're in, they're literally intubating two year olds on the ER floor because they've gotten into the mom's hemp gummies. You're not going to have that with the medical program because every dispensing organization, number one, it's in childproof packaging. Number two, they're going to educate you on safe storage of the material. They all sell locking mechanisms and lock boxes that are approved for cannabis medication to keep it out of the reach of children. Right. Right now, could, yeah, because yeah, you can just go and buy a little bag and it's, it's opened up. It's up, derp, and just like, like, you know, like, and if a kid yeah. sees a gummy, they're going to well, eat Because they think gummies. it's a gummy. They think it's yeah. a candy. And, a and I've seen that when we have, uh, when you have a black market that, it, that is so accessible because all the, the, the weed that's not getting sold in Oklahoma and Utah, and every, or not Utah, but Arizona, and, and the, all of them coming straight here to Texas. Why? Because big bucks here, you know? And... Without a good regulated market, you don't know what you're going to get, and you're going to. This is not something you can't put this toothpaste back into the tube. Uh, Texas has taken way too long trying to to assess this, and it's going to get to a point where, guys, you've created a, a another problem, and now we have three or four problems versus the one problem we would have had ten years ago. A robust black market because we're not making Extremely progress. Extremely robust black market. Our operators are at the end of their rope. I mean, they are very, being very candid with the state of Texas. Like, we cannot continue to sustain. We've operated at a loss for, mm -hmm. you know, seven plus years at this point because we were promised y'all were going to work with us and help expand. You have not done absolutely nothing, and we are losing exactly. too much money at this point. I don't know if Stephanie Click being out of the primary is going to help out or not. Uh, well, the good news she is... She was the creator of this. Yeah. Well, the legislature recognized the... the I was very heartened by the hearing. Um, a, lo a lot of the hemp industry is, is screaming like doom and gloom and, and accusing the medical dispensing organizations of being behind this push to... That's, what to That's mm -hmm. not true at all. Um, number one, the lieutenant governor encountered some highly intoxicating hemp products on, on his own, was shown statistics of access to, I mean, just... Uh, excuse my language, but utter idiots who put up vending machines next to middle schools without age verification with not only like Delta 8 products, we're talking HHC, THCO, highly synthetic products. And the middle schoolers are going across the street and using it. There's an association of high school principals who are in the ear of the governor and the lieutenant governor saying, we wish we could go back to the vaping epidemic. Because at least when it was vaping, they were in the bathroom just hitting a normal vape with nicotine. Now, they're in the bathroom taking a THC vape. Yep. And there are like, um, I saw one, one of the principals, there was a shop raid quite recently up here in North Texas. And one of the principals actually showed some of our leadership, one of the devices. It looks just like a highlighter. The kid can be sitting there in the class and it's a vape that looks just like a highlighter. Yeah. yeah. And it so is. the hemp industry is screaming like, oh, medical's coming after us. No, the consequences of the actions of the bad actors are coming after them. So the legislature, what we really need to do is have 21 and up age restrictions on intoxicating products, child resistance requirements, no, you know, packaging that's attractive to a child, those kinds of things, and uh, expand medical. If we don't expand medical, we are, we're in a bad way here in Texas after yeah. 2025. Well, yeah, go ahead. So how do you feel about the synthetics, like the HHC and the... Synthetics? They shouldn't... I, I am no prohibitionist, but the methods that can be used to make... So THCA is not a synthetic. THCA is tetrahydrocannabinoic acid, and it's actually what's in the plant. It's the precursor to THC. When you apply heat to THCA, that's what converts it to THC. So THC, I, I'm, I'm not against whatsoever, but some of these synthetics that are fully lab-created... Um, call me a prohibitionist all you want, but we do not need a chemical that is isomerized that is a thousand times more potent than THC. Mm -hmm. Why? No. I, Those things need to be regulated. They're dangerous, they yeah. Extremely need to be regulated. You're seeing them pop up, not only uh, just in, these, in um, the uh, vending machines, because a lot of American Legions of VFWs have these vending machines. Yeah, and but they at least have age. No, but they have age. And, and I've been to many American Legions of VFWs, and they are not keen about kids coming into there. They don't allow them. Get out. It's this ain't for you. Yeah. yeah. This is not, you know, this is not, if it's just you coming in here, they're not going to let you come in there. Um, but that being said, too, the American, the VF, Texas VFW and the American Legion have also noticed that uh, this needs to be regulated. Because how do we know with what we're giving our, our guys? Is this Ex good? Exactly. And yeah. that, that's something that I think that we all are concerned about. And it can be done and it can be priced easily. 
every other state out there that has a good medical program, people are being able to get their products for a very fair price. In fact, they're probably noticing that they're spending less money on prescriptions and, and, and probably an equal the, amount of the money market, yeah. than, than the reg market. And our dispensing organizations would love to lower the prices on the formulations and targeted therapies available. But when the entry costs are so high and when the state maintains I mean, probably the thickness of a Bible of unwritten regulations that the dispensing organizations have to comply with on the back end that the, the public is not aware of and they're not written down anywhere. Um, but our dispensing organizations are, and rightfully so, uh, you know, a little bit hesitant to sue because that's the regulators that are in there every single week. And I'm not exaggerating when I say DPS is in these dispensing organizations weekly. Then we've got a problem. That's going to lead to increased costs when they have so many hoops to jump through just to get the medication to people here in Texas. It's insane, and it's not right, and so I hope we have a lot of voices showing up in 2025 um, to really advocate for expanded medical, because if we don't get it, we will lose our program. It is. They didn't vote it last time. We gave that so, super hard this year. Yeah, last year they didn't do anything, mm -hmm. and that was intentional. I, I need doctors showing out in droves yeah, during was, session. Was like me, like one of the person. Yeah. Like three or four of us. So how can um, people get more involved in where can they go to ensure that their voice is heard or they support? So, number one, don't underestimate the value of just a phone call to your legislator's office. That is always, they do listen to those. I know because we get them on the back end when we're drafting this legislation that impacts everyone. Second is here in Texas, it's, it's terrible because you will sit there all day. They always push cannabis or hemp to the end of the mm -hmm. agenda because they want to make everybody sit there all day until 3, 4 in the morning sometimes. Um, which I think is a terrible way to treat, you know, particularly some of our veterans who are incapable often of sitting there for that long. Um, but you do always have the option to do public testimony or written testimony. And, you know, if you follow our law firm on social media, if there is any big hearing or big change, we do our best to post about it to let people know. Like, if you can't be there, here's how you submit written. If you can be there, get there and in person. And then the number one thing I always say that people can do is exactly what we're doing right now talking about it because the more you talk about it the less the yeah. stigma is gonna you know one thing I like to do when I'm on a, a stage with like a big crowd is if it's a non-cannabis crowd I get up and I'll be very honest and say I am a cannabis user and a lot of people are like oh my god a lawyer just got on stage and said that and I'm like we should have no issue and that's how we have to push the stigma out of these conversations yeah and your doctors right and the people that take care of you the ones that you know they have have a little bit of little, uh, you know, seniority, no, not seniority, but like empower in pushing it out, right? Because, um, and those people who, you know, and those people who have a little, who don't have a good understanding of it, right? I mean, the more people that understand it, have knowledge of it, you know, the better it's gonna be for everybody, right? Because most people just don't know because they, they just don't know, right? Do you think the DEA, because um, one of the things I had thought about was developing, a, you know, a, what are y'all, y'all aren't CLEs, they're CLOs. CMEs. CMEs. So, you know, the DEA came out with a pronouncement on the opioid <coughs> alternative and you can self-certify training, yeah. mm -hmm. but which is terrible, yeah. I think. But do you think that will cause more doctors to start learning about medical yeah. care? Well, it depends if like the, if that's a, that's a necessary subject, right? Like if it's like you have to because, you know, they have this opiate thing now, we have to learn about opiates. Why not put cannabis in that as far as like for pain relief? You know, it's, it's not even in our CME anything about cannabis. Not but have, yeah. so I mean, I think I think you should have an alternative way, like maybe like an alternative medicine, like or t some type of like, you know, there needs to be some type of education that we can get. You know, I got asked to do a CME for you know for the cannabis roundup for some doctors, oh, okay. but I don't know who, I don't know who's going to show up though for the CME. You know what I'm saying? Well, like. They, they don't know that. You know, so I, I mean, I'm telling all my associates about it and so I posted they, about it, but I don't know how doctors that want to care to come learn about cannabis. Like, yeah. are they going to do it? The DFW Hospital Council, I had lunch with Steve Love back in um, November. Uh, you know who Steve Love is? Mm -hmm. So I'm talking to him and he asked us to be a part of uh, the Methodist Hospital had a, uh, had a uh, function where they wanted to talk about cannabis. So they contacted me, and I brought Dr. Dorita Doshe. Oh, Richard Cheng was there. Which is fantastic. So Richard and both, and Dr. Doshe and I were up on the panel. Mm -hmm. Steve Love was there as well. He's like, I complete. I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know much about it. We had this conversation, and he was like, I loved it. He's like, man, I tell you what, I believe that this would reduce cost for everybody. It absolutely will, yeah. but the problem is there's not a, a doctor-centric organization that is picking up mm -hmm 
the burden of getting them to the CMEs. Like I had um, mm -hmm. a, you know, stuff of the dispensing organizations. This is conversations we have about. I truly think doctors are going to be the key to this to expanding this program. They're not listening to the dispensing organizations. They're not listening to patients. They historically have not listened to doctors. But if we get enough doctors out, yeah. I think we yeah. can see true change in this program. But how do we? They, 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 this, needs, this needs to be more of us. That's all. The ones that are prescribing, we need to do better at kind of getting together and, and organizing ourselves. Like, because I, I, I feel like. I feel like I'm alone on an island. I don't talk yeah. to anyone else about this, any, well, like position-wise. And I've, I've no one else talked to. It's always me. Like, it's on my phone. I speak about myself all the time, everything. Like, you know, I'm like, where are these guys at? Like Four doctors yeah. rotating yeah, speaking events and well, stuff. Well, one of the things that we like doing, these, these types of organizations where we go to VFWs, American Legions, and we're going to start doing this throughout DFW. Yeah. And so you guys will probably be seeing more of us yeah, okay. at each one. The more that we do it, the more the word gets out. Right. And when I told you earlier, like I was talking to Steve Love about the DFW Hospital Complex, mm -hmm. uh, not Hospital Complex, Hospital Council, they are interested. They They're want to get off schedule one. Yeah. Once it goes to schedule three, I will promise you we will be approaching them. And they're going to want our organization, our organization's full of professionals, yeah. and we're going to bring it in. And we're going to, we're going to bring them something that we can keep on. And so I, I love you guys being part of our team. I do appreciate you coming out here. Well, and thank you all for having us. Continue to do to revise it better.